Cut it out. Cut it out. I wonder how long. We're live. We're live. We're live. Okay, live. I'm, I'm just so I wonder how long I could go before anybody would be like, "This is offensive." <laughs> it, There's an offensive point. Right. You just gotta know if you get there. Right. All right. So we're gonna jump right into it. Everything you absolutely need to know about credit scores, from the most basic stuff to some hacks, we're gonna drop on you right now, right off the top, because we know you need to know. And those of us who think you know, guess what? Sometimes when it comes to credit. There's a lot that you may have missed because you never got a financial literacy course in high school and college. Right. At any point in your life, most likely. And why does it matter? Because someday you're going to want to buy a car. You may want to lease a car. You may want to buy a home. You may want to rent a place. They might run your credit. So all this is very important. Yeah. So a bit of a caveat right off the top with this. Fannie Mae, okay, a government-sponsored enterprise, GSE, well, they are now actually kind of pivoting away from the traditional credit scoring process to other algorithms. As of today, the date of this show, which happens to be March 5th, 2024, this is still the credit score that everybody uses, the FICO scoring system. But in the not too distant future, this will consider to be outdated because this is not a true and accurate representation of your risk as an individual for credit purposes and why the way we use credit has changed so dramatically in the last 10 to 20 years. And you'll see really soon why it's it'll be easy to actually manipulate your score. So right off the top, factors that make up your credit score, payment history is 35%. The single largest chunk of your credit score is made up by how consistent and on time you make your payments over the course of your lifetime. Right, it's true. So uh, just take it one step back. So a credit score can, is any score that ranges somewhere between 300 to 850. Chris, what's yours? Uh, 820-something. 820-something. Mine's 805. And this actually, in order to have anything above 700, this needs to remain perfect. Mm. There's, you cannot have any late payments. And by we don't mean a late payment by several days. That, can, that happens. But really what we're talking about is like a 30-day late payment that gets marked um, and it gets sent to the credit bureaus. Yeah, a lot of people freak out like, oh, my God, I didn't pay my payment. I'm five, ten days late. You're generally okay. Unless you're literally 30 days late, generally speaking, you're not going to get reported to a credit bureau. And if you are in that time, you can dispute it with the credit bureau. So right off, right right there, good point of, point of fact, there are three main credit bureaus, okay? Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Believe it or not, not everybody reports into all three. And not everybody pulls all three reports. All three reports, when they somebody goes to a, all three bureaus and pulls it back, it's something called a tri-merge report. They're pulling... Basically, all three credit scores, there's going to be a high one, a low one, and a middle one. And most people who are going to say, hey, Saeed's FICO score is 805, that they're going to take that middle score, and that's really what the 805 is reflective of. Right. Exactly. And something else that one little uh, rule of thumb that I kind of live by, if I ever opened up a credit card, one thing that I automatically did off the top was set up automatic payments. So that way, for sure, it's always hitting the minimum payment. That way, I never, ever have to worry about a late payment towards like my credit card. Yeah, fantastic way to do it. I actually do a sweep like this for uh, one charge that comes through on one smaller credit card of mine that doesn't go on the Amex. And that because that charge get, gets extra coverage, coverage through my bank for like my cell phone and stuff like that. Right. Uh, but yeah, that kind of leads us into the next, uh, I guess, kind of segue, if you will, collection accounts. If you happen to be in a situation where your account was not paid on time, you happen to go into something known as collections, basically the original a uh, person who had the debt has sold it off to somebody else to collect or they go, they have their own internal collection department and they show you on your credit report as past due in collections. Right. Okay. If you do not pay the full amount paid as owed and you pay lesser than, it actually impacts your credit score. So if you call up your previous vendor, let's say it's American Express, and you say, hey, I owed you a bunch of money. Now I'm in collections. I know it was $5,000. Would you take 2500 They say yes. Even though you paid and you paid less than agreed, it actually dings your credit score pretty significantly still, even though you paid it current or paid it off, I should say, because your account's going to be closed at that point in time. Right. And for let's just say you do, uh, for whatever reason, you apply for credit somewhere and you do get access to your credit report and you, something something like this does pop up. This is something you need to tackle and get ahead of like right away. Right. Uh, a big problem back in the day. It's not as much of a problem anymore because lenders are now looking at it differently, like Chris mentioned at the top of the show. But a lot of times what a lot of people would get hit with these medical uh, collection accounts. Man, those used to hit credit credit reports all the time. There's been some new law changes, too, yes. which kind of significantly limited the ability for them to get on your people would have literally collection accounts on their 
for like ten dollar copays that they didn't get billed when they went there. They sent them a bill afterward. They never got it. And these ten dollar copays would wind up in collections, right. medical collection agencies. And I, you'd be like, "Come on, man!" I had seen that happen so many times where, and then I would even be leaving the hospital and say, "We'll bill you the pay." I'm like, no, 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 I'm gonna pay right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't trust you, bro. Yeah, exactly. All right, so if you have a credit card, and let's say you've got a five thousand dollar limit, okay, amounts owed is 30% of your score. So again, payment history, 35% amounts owed 30%. And utilization ratio is a key part of amounts owed. So for example, if you have that $5,000 credit limit and you're using all $5,000, you're fully maxed out, but you're paying on time and everything else is paid as agreed, that's actually going to lower your score. It has a 30% impact to your overall score. And that can be bad for you. Now, on the other hand, if you're on the extreme opposite side of the spectrum and you have zero utilization, but $5,000 of available credit and you haven't used a single dollar of it, guess what? It actually isn't that good of a thing for you either. Right. There's a healthy medium and it's really, really hard to navigate because there is no hard and fast rule, but you need to use a little bit of credit and pay it down and pay it off. Right. But you don't want to use too much credit and utilize way too much where it looks like you're maxed out. Exactly. So a little rule of thumb that I've always lived by, I don't know... Uh, if there's any true science or any good information out there to back this, but I, I use a 30% rule. Never go over 30%. Make sure it never crosses that barrier. And usually, and typically, in the past, I'm not going to act like I've never carried a balance over mm -hmm. month over month. But it, when I am managing my debts properly, I'm paying them off, um, you know, to their to their fullest. But never crossing that 30% threshold. Like Chris said, if you if you have a $5,000 limit and you're using all $5,000. Why does that seem so bad? You're like, wait, they're giving me five access to five thousand dollars. I should be able to use it. Well, the credit bureaus and other lenders who are looking at this might see you as being in financial distress, and they may not think you're able to pay back that five thousand dollars. All right, so I'm gonna give everybody a free hack here. One of the questions I get asked a lot about is, "Hey, Chris, how do I get a Centurion card? I want the black card, right?" Ooh. So, and I think people misunderstand that this is something that it's not. But what I will say is you really get a card like that by having a disciplined ideology around your utilization ratio and paying consistently over time. The 65% of what makes up your credit score that we already spoke about, it really is the key to getting there. Now, obviously, you have to spend a lot in order to get it, and you have to have certain assets and net worth and all these things to look at. But it really comes down to those. And the reason why it's so important is, number one, I use an American Express card because it's a charge card, not a credit card. And there is a main difference. A credit card, you can pay the minimum payment at the end of the month, right? Right. And while American Express does offer charge cards where you pay the minimum payment at the end of the month, but you still have a balance after you make that payment, the traditional American Express methodology was a charge card, meaning you pay the entire balance off at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who listen to the show for any prolonged period of time, you know that we recommend you have a credit card, which you put all of your spending on that you can. It builds you loyalty points. It keeps all of your charges onto one card. And criminals, fraud that comes through, can't get to your bank account. It gives you that separation of church and state, if you will, and it allows you to dispute charges. And American Express is spectacular when it comes to disputed charges. So it was really that consistency of use of that charge card, which I paid off every single month, that as my spending built up over time, really built, number one, a loyalty with them as a brand. Number two, I showed a pattern and practice of paying it off every single month in full, and I never spent more than I actually planned on paying off at the end of the month. And number three, it showed that my spending was progressive load over time. Right. Right. And because it's all in one card, it shows the maximum spending because I'm spending all of my spending there. Mm -hmm. So, and that is a good kind of way into run into the next section. Loyalty does matter to credit cards. Believe it or not, length of credit history yeah. is 15% of your score. So again, payment history, 35%. Amounts owed, 30%. And now length of your credit history, 15%. If you're 18 years old, you get your first credit card, guess what? Your length of credit history is not long. Right. So what, something that you want to always keep in mind is I remember uh, when I was in college, I opened up a college credit card. It was at Wells Fargo because at the time I was working for Wells Fargo. I no longer have my accounts there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but that's now my longest. Uh, trade uh, line. Yeah. Trade line. Trade line. Exactly. You, there you, you, go. you saw where I was, yeah, you see I, where I I was see going. You. Yeah. So it's my longest trade line. So even though I don't have bank accounts with them anymore, it would actually hurt my credit score if I close down that card. That is correct. Because it impacts my credit history and it's there for so long. Incrementally right? so. So I've got a couple different uh, tips here that I think are uncommon, okay? Number one, when I was 18, uh, actually no, I was younger than that, I think. My dad walked me into Wells Fargo. He opened up three accounts for me. A checking, a savings, and a credit card account. Perfect. 
I still have that credit card account to this day. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I have it to this day is because it doesn't hurt me because there's not an annual fee associated with it. Right. And because it works as overdraft protection, I think, for my original other accounts in a worst case event scenario that I need it. Mm -hmm. That being said, I don't ever use it. It doesn't hurt me. No point in closing it. But my limit on it is like fifteen or $16,000. Meanwhile, I've got a Centurion card with literally no limit on it. Right. And this is a good point out point for everybody else. If you're trying to get a credit card with a higher limit, the odds are you're going to have to open up a new account somewhere else as you financially grow. Because you can increase your income over time. But keep in mind, if you're using your card appropriately, and you're only using about 30% of it at most, right? Or maybe you max it out once or twice ever. You pay it down, and let's say you're doing all the right things. Most credit card providers aren't going to give you a massive increase without you calling and asking for it. And even if you call and ask for it, it's not going to be that significant. You're better off applying for a better card with a higher limit as your career progresses and as you start to make more money over time. Because unfortunately, whether you like it or not, your current vendor is unlikely to meet your needs as you grow and scale. Right. And typically that'll happen with the, you know, the institution that you're currently banking with because they're also seeing all the activity that's coming in and out of your account, mm -hmm. right? So they're able to cross check and verify everything you know, because they do actually come out and ask you what your stated income is. Right. But they're able to see whether if that makes sense or not based on the activity levels in your account. Now, something that I found out later down the line was that credit card that I originally opened up with offered something like a cell phone insurance plan. Have you ever mm -hmm. heard of this? Yeah, that's why I use my current Wells Fargo card still yeah. to this day is it, it runs through there and it automatically auto pays from my auto drafts from my checking yeah. account. Yeah, and it so I've actually had to use this before when my cell phone screen cracked and all mm -hmm. I had to do is pay a $50 deductible and they were they covered the entire cost. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, why would I ever get rid of this? Not to mention my length of credit history. Although I will admit, Centurion just told me they had the exact same service, but a better one. Yeah. So yeah. now I'm thinking about closing the Wells Fargo one. But right. so again, this is also worthwhile to think about. If you have a credit card that has an annual fee, right? It may be worthwhile to close it. And a great example for those of you who want to know about the American Express side of things, and this applies to all credit cards, not just American Express, when you get the offer to join the Centurion, uh, you know, status, whatever the bullshit is, right? You get the plat card offer. They keep your old platinum card. Okay. So you don't actually upgrade the card to another one. So that's it. You have your old card. Well, that old card, I think, has like a seven hundred dollar annual fee for it. Plus, the American Express has their membership initiation fee. Plus, that's five thousand dollars per card annually for that black card. Wow. So it makes no sense, especially if you know how I spend on one card to have the platinum card and the black card. Exactly. So what do we do? We said, okay, this has got a fee. Yes, it hurts my credit score incrementally to close the account, but we're not going to use it, my wife and I. So we literally close those because we don't pay the annual fee. There you go. So we decided to take the small nominal hit to our credit score and close down the length of time that that credit's been available, knowing that we're going to rebuild a little bit of that with this. And it, it only took about a year or so to kind of bounce back up. Right, and that's something worth noting, right? If you are going to make a move like this, you kind of have to know – foresee like what you plan on doing in the upcoming future and if you know there's you don't have any big purchases in mind and or if it's something that can be easily explained to a lender right mm -hmm. then, then sometimes lenders will accept the letter of explanation to kind of explain what what happened there yeah so and then the next item on, the, on this is obviously new credit 10 percent. 10 percent of your credit score is made up by opening new accounts in a short period of time now that sounds like unreasonable for most people but when you think about it, the context of life there are several different types of credit out there, right? You've got long-term long -term installment loans, like mm -hmm. auto loans, right? like home loans. I mean, they have some now as high as 10-year auto loans now. Yeah, wild. Crazy. But, so you're going to have a 40-year mortgage, man. We've called it before. Yep. That's happening. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Moment of silence for all of our finances. Anyway. <laughs> uh, then you have like student loan debt, and you'll have term, like revolving debt, like credit cards. Yes. Now, all three of those are actually different types of credit that report on your on your credit report. Mm -hmm. But all three of them are very, very different indicators of your ability to repay over time. Obviously, your mortgage carries a much longer history. So having a mortgage can actually anchor your credit score in a good, healthy standing. But for so many of us, we can't get that. So what am I going to tell you? Really focus on making consistent payments on your auto debt because that term debt over time, that installment loan being paid down from a very large amount to a very little amount over the course of years is going to wind up being an anchor to your credit score when you're starting out. And once that actually does get paid off, it doesn't hurt your credit uh, score the way 
if you were to close down a credit card, this actually will boost it up once it's actually paid off because the type of credit that it is. Correct. And then lastly, types of credit in use makes up the last remaining 10%, which we've kind of just covered a little bit. But what I will point out is that you need to think about how you're going to attack these things over time. A lot of people go, oh, great, I learned it. I want my credit score to be amazing. It doesn't stop there once you get that score. You have to constantly be monitoring this. A lot of banks, a lot of credit card companies will offer you something called a vantage score or a soft pull kind of look, and they'll basically give you their recreated number for you. Basically, they're not pulling from Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion. They know what the algorithm is for the, the credit score, and they know essentially where your numbers are coming from in a, in a soft pull. And they're recreating what your score most likely is based on your current activity, which is why Saeed and I know what our scores are. We're not pulling our credit reports all the time, but we know that that's effectively what our bank or our credit card tells us our effective equivalent score is as of today. Right, exactly. And why, again, why this should matter to you is if you have a good credit score, right, let's say somewhere above 750 around to where Chris is at. What'd you say you're at? 820 something. 820 something, right? You're going to get better interest rates from lenders because they they believe you're less risk than someone that doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're out, going out to buy a home that's $400,000 right now, median sales price of a, of a home, right? And you put down 20%, 80000 you're getting a loan for 320000 You might get a 7% rate. Someone with a lesser score might get an 8% rate. You might say that's only a 1% difference, but that's a difference of $220 a month in your payment, Yeah. right? So now think, it, I mean, we'd all like to have an extra $220 in our, in our pockets. Now imagine if you could have taken that 220 and just invested it, right? Over the long haul, how much money could that make you? A lot. A lot of money, right? So this stuff actually matters, and um, you want to set yourself up for financial success. Actually, according to our previous segment um, that went viral with your face on it, it could make you a million dollars by the time you're 65. How many views was that? 1.3 million, yeah. Uh, for the record, TikTok would not verify my account afterward. Yeah. I, th I think it's because your face is on it. <laughs> <laughs> I take blame for that. <laughs> like, this is not the right guy. Like, what are you talking about? All right, well. Uh, those of you might be asking, what the fuck am I listening to and who are these guys? Welcome back to the Higher Standard Podcast. We are the number one financial literacy podcast in the world. Sitting next to me, my partner in time, the one and only Saeed Omar, everybody. Thank you, my man. Sitting next to me on my left is my partner in crime, Chris Nahibi. Welcome back to the show, everybody. And behind the ones and twos, the man who pops cans in the middle of the show. If you're lucky, you'll catch it. The one and only DJ Arun. Damn, we got no cans tonight either. Oh, oh. You, so you better fucking find one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, oh, there's a Red Bull back there, but we all know how that sounds. Psst. Yeah. Psst. It's, a soft, yeah. it's a soft open. Yeah, it's it's lacking some testosterone. Yeah, it's a gender neutral can. <laughs> 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 all right, on tonight's show, we've got some sector performance to talk about. We're going to talk about a little bit about what's happened today. I think it was very indicative, and tomorrow is a big day. We'll explain why shortly. The key Fed inflation measure rose 0.4% in January, as expected, up 2.8% from a year ago. And our favorite letter, the Kabisi letter, has a core services less than shelter inflation as a key metric the Fed follows, also known as super core inflation. Super. Yeah. They try to make it sound so cool. Like all these new names, man. Super core. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Uh, Super cool. Let's go. All right. <laughs> Rent is driving inflation, but there's something off in the data. We're going to go back to the Kobisi letter for pending home sales, which are officially back to 2008 levels. God damn, Kobisi, are you going to sponsor the podcast or I mean, what? God damn it, bro. Like, we're sending so much love your way. I probably shouldn't talk shit because I haven't really subscribed to his, like, premium service. <laughs> <laughs> so You might as well. I know. I probably should. But I'm cheap. I mean, you cite him all the time. You're, just not, you're not plagiarizing. I know, but um, I got to be honest, I'm cheap. Cheap, got I, it. It's, just, it's not that I'm a bad person, it's I'm frugal. Right. Yeah. You know, I don't really wear designer stuff. I'm going to roll X's on. <laughs> you had to check. <laughs> I'm like, you I'm had to check. Say Gucci, is it? Yeah, no. <laughs> while, while rocking the Travis. Yeah, I got a new pair coming too. Uh, okay, and there's a Wharton professor. Uh, well, sees a $34 trillion. Uh, of a problem. That's a lot of billions. Yeah, uh, coming for a meltdown, as he called it. And, uh, well, we're going to get into that. And then there's an awesome review at the ass end of the show. The ass end. Yeah. You got to stay tuned for that. Because for our podcast listeners, whether that's on Apple or Spotify, please head over and leave us an honest five-star review. Really does a lot for the show, and we greatly appreciate it. If you're watching us over on YouTube, 
Please make sure you like, subscribe, hit, ring that notification bell. Let's try to get this episode to as many people as possible. Do all the moist, goody good sassafras. I like the the new ad of getting this to as many people as possible. I like was, that? I heard it the first time. I wasn't listening to the first show, the last show. I ignore you during this whole segment normally. <laughs> And then you did that, and I was like, "Oh, that was that was good." Oh, that was I, nice. Was little, was yeah, you saw that? that. Okay, I, was yeah. like, All right. I, I thought so too. That's why I decided to run it back. Oh, I would sleep with that guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if look, if you're listening to the show and you think, "How can how can I support these guys?" Well, we have a fantastic way to do so, where you get to support yourself, your health, your longevity. You want to feel better? Get your blood work done. Go to transcendcompany.com/thsp. That'll support the show. Obviously, anything you go and you do on that link, but more importantly, you can get your blood work done. Figure out if there's something they can do for you, whether that's hormone therapy, that's longevity and stuff, even some skincare stuff, which I got coming my way for the wife, uh, which is fantastic. I recommend you check it out. DM us with any questions. Send us messages our way. Happy to answer anything you got. I'm on a lot of peptides at the moment. Motsi, uh, Tesafenzine. I've tried BPC-157. And as much as all stuff, this stuff is stigmatized, I feel great. So Yeah, and don't, don't be worried. They're not pushy salespeople over there. They're actually a great team that really want to help you out. They're not as pushy as we are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into the show. All right. So today was an interesting day in the markets. I didn't think it was going to be as controversial as it wound up being, but you saw the Dow down almost uh, a little over 500 points and then back settled somewhere around below that throughout the day. Yet stocks were at session lows, and I started going, wait a minute, wait a minute, there, there's a lot going on here. I started seeing the bond market start to react, and you started to see the 2, 5, 10, and 30-year bonds drop pretty visibly in a single day. Now, these these drop by smaller numbers, so they don't look as big. You got the two-year at 4.5. You got the 10-year at 4.139. So we're still in an inverted yield curve. Obviously, a pre-recessionary indicator, as you've heard on the show prior to this. But the Dow and the NASDAQ got hit hard today. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just the truth. The bond market was reacting clearly in a way that says, yikes, not good. No. What the hell? That inversion's getting bigger. Inversion's getting bigger. You know, I like that big inversion. Do you, you, you like when inversions get bigger? And uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's having a fucking day. Bro, what the hell's going on? All-time high, 69K peak, came down just after the peak. I did hear the sound of you crying in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 I know a lot of people are not happy about this, but they're saying this has a lot to do with um, the ETFs and the funds. I have a different theory. I know that people are saying that it has a lot to do with the, the new crypto funds and ETFs that are out there. And, is this, uh, and fuck no real Rubini. I'm not over that. Tinfoil hat time? Or tin, is no, this no, no, no. Yeah, fuck it. Tinfoil hat time. Okay. Okay. But before I go there, no real Rubini, you piece of shit. Yeah. God damn it. I'm still hurt. I, was, I wanted you on this show so bad. So bad. And then he co-signed an ETF. And he hasn't said a negative word about crypto since. And honestly, I saw him actually making the rounds again the other day saying, you know, a soft landing might be, might be possible. Well, ironically, that's exactly what I think the opposite of, uh, of what the world is saying. How do you hedge gold, Said? I don't know. How do you hedge gold? You typically invest in the stock market. Okay. How do you invest? How do you hedge the stock market these days? Uh, how do you hedge? Just uh, cash? Keep me cash? Liquidity? You could. Or you could go into something called Bitcoin. Oh, oh the, that's, what they're, that's what they want you to think. The timing seems kind of impeccable. Well, okay. But there's, there is no true hedge against inflation. We've said that. Countless times again. The only real hedge for inflation is to keep investing. Yeah. Sorry, kids. That's the only real one. Everybody else on social media is trying to sell you some bullshit. Right. All right. But if we go back to uh, Arun, just going right away from my notes. Come on. Scroll back up there a little bit. Tiny bit, tiny bit. There you go. Stop right there. Okay. Try to follow along now, okay? All right. Okay. That's oh, he's, good. He's that's good. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't get sexual with it. Slower. All right. So 72% probability of a rate cut in July now. Mm. That is the highest probability to come, obviously. Nearly all sectors in the S&P, there are 11 sectors in the S&P. Energy, information technology, consumer staples, industrials, consumer discretionary, healthcare, financials, all the good stuff, mm -hmm. right? Out of the 11 sectors, the overwhelming majority, nine of them are negative in the um, S&P 500. Yep, that's a bad sign. Nine of them are negative, okay? One of them was damn near borderline negative, okay? Mm -hmm financials and the rest of them well the two that were remaining energy and consumer staples they're positive i think the end of the day was energy consumer staples and financials incrementally positive but let's be honest here this is fucked up so i care about this you care about this mm -hmm. investors around in the u.s all care about this you know yeah. who does not care about this mm. jerome powell yes jerome powell um who is the head of the fomc right the head of the fed yeah right 
He's going to be uh, he's going to be doing his semi-annual monetary policy report to Congress before to the U.S. House Financial Services Committee tomorrow. Tomorrow, same day as the Beige Book coming out, March sixth, twenty twenty-four. By the time you hear this, you're probably thinking that motherfucker. I heard what he said. Yeah, because this is this is now everyone's going to be tuning into this because we got a positive uh, PCE inflation report, right? Mm -hmm. Some it's definitely headed in the right direction. It's got a nice little two handle on it. The what, what he's been asking for, getting inflation down to two percent, a firm two percent, right? Yeah, but firm. I like it. Firm, but um, Let's grab it. Like my glutes after the deadlifts, bro. You've got, you got the glutes and the booty to be. My a, hammies are yeah. A female fitness. I model. feel I could have been an amazing Olympic lifter. Uh, why didn't you pursue that? I, w I wasn't privy to it. I mean, you don't have to go high off the ground either. It's I know exactly. Like you're like a. A boom up right there like, just, uh, yeah, just yeah so but so this ha actually happens twice a year this isn't just because of what we're currently going what's currently going on in the economy Jerome Powell come stepping in front of congress congress and talking about the beige report yeah, he in front of congress a lot so. congress <laughs> gang is congress you know like, what i mean gang is biggest gangster of all time <laughs> right yeah, dude he's having sex with everybody that was that was his biggest goal Right, I, f I can't remember. Genghis like, Khan like fathered everybody. I think he actually his his bloodline is in like one percent of the entire like global like yeah, population. Bro, like that, That's he, crazy. One guy. Yeah, no. Or like maybe it was a point five percent. Still a lot. Something wild. I don't care, bro. If I'm ever that that historically known, I, I won. Like I like you won. Yeah. Like you you did something. We talked about it before. Like how do you go from being someone that's like a mass murderer like that to then being like mortalized for being the greatest emperor of all time. You have a really fly mustache. I mean, it's that, that's, that's what back happens. then. Yeah. It was the flyest. It's, it, but the problem is it can go the other way too. Cause you know, Hitler has one. You can't even, you cannot rock that. Like, There's right. no world where you can wear that mustache today. Exactly. So like, that, you, that's like, true. That's wildly inappropriate. But Extremely you, inappropriate. But you so, could rock the Genghis Khan. All so like long. someone could get a Genghis Khan tattoo and be like, Oh, that's a dope tattoo. Greatest emperor of all time. But if you have one of Hitler, it's like, Whoa, 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 Whoa. It's the wrong mustache. That's yeah. Can't do is that. it or is it because it's too soon? You no. You ever done like the thin up top upper lip mustache? I've never no. I've always wanted to, it, but I feel like it's a lot of work. A lot of work. It's a lot of work. I feel like I my mean to, to bring that, that down. It's my lips yeah. Too it's big not. It's that, not for yeah. me. Yeah. Plus the gap. It's like does not sit on top. I know a lot of people like that. It's really it's clean look. It's clean. I just yeah. I can't pull it off. Rune, you look like a guy who could absolutely not pull that off. Never. <laughs> Do you listen to the show at all? Everybody? Oh, man, I got hit up by so many people, by the way, at work. For what? They said, oh, Rune needs a camera. They're begging for it. Begging for it? Yeah, they're like, it would be great for the show. How? Well, because they, people, actually, my phone. people actually care. They want to see your reaction. What? Even even if even if you don't say anything, they want to see your reaction to the shit that we say. I just want to see him in a deep V. A DB. <laughs> <laughs> he rocks the DBs. <laughs> can you do a favor? Can you actually pay attention to the show and scroll down a little bit? Because we passed this segment a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you <laughs> Thank go. you so much. All right. So the next Federal Open Market Committee FOMC meeting will be held March 19th through March 20th, 24. So it is coming up, mm -hmm. right? It is not surprising that following the hotter than expected U.S. CPI and PPI inflation numbers for January, lots of people are waiting for today's PCE release, often regarded as the Federal Reserve's favorite inflation measure. As I noted before, the consensus forecasts are for 0.2% month over month inflation and 2.4% uh, on an annualized basis. But Saeed, tell them what they won. So we actually hit expectations, right, which is a good sign. We hit the expectations were 2.4 percent. We hit 2.4 percent. That was the headline figure, right? Mm -hmm. But what the Fed likes to look at is what's core inflation. So what's that's when they remove food and energy. When you remove food and energy, we're at 2.8 percent. Okay, we're getting really granular here. I get it. To some people, this could be boring or flying right over their head. But not when I say it. It's sexy <laughs> as fuck. It's sexy as fuck. But all this real, all you really need to know is, look, we're trending down. We're headed in the right direction. This is what the Fed has routinely said. This is the report that we care about. Mm, yeah. Now, remember, Jerome Powell came out and said, we need, I need to see more evidence to give me more confidence. Out of the overcorrect and undercorrect, higher for longer, all the language you've already heard. Yeah. Mohammed Arain, which is not in the show notes, has come out now on X, Twitter, 
And he has said on multiple occasions, and in, in, look, this guy, we've talked about him on the previous show, he's got experience. He's got pedigree. He's called things. The Great Recession, for example. He has been very, very clear if the Fed doesn't start cutting soon, they will not be able to stop the trajectory going down and force us into recession. And there is a growing chorus of people who are very much concerned about it. And I am one of those people. Yeah. I'm in the chorus, and I don't like singing. Right. And something that I, we actually haven't gone back and said for quite some time, that I want to make sure is very, really, really clear here. This whole inflation problem that has been cited and everyone's been talking about, which is why rates are so high, which is why your credit card payments are so high, which is why mortgage rates are so high, which is why all the shit's fucked up, right? This is all the Fed's fault. Okay, let's not let's not forget that. Okay. Oh uh, shit! I'm a show. Yeah. So <laughs> them them trying to correct this issue, it's their issue. They acted too late. Right, a hundred percent. They acted too late. Right, remember that's, that's so a known quantity. That's a known quantity. So, but now here's another layer to this that we've also said on the show, but that we haven't said in quite some time. People often mistake the Fed and the government don't work together on this issue; they're working sometimes against each other. Oh hell yeah, they are. Especially around election time. So, what came out during in this PCE report? Something that was noteworthy. Okay, there's a, there's a portion of the report that's called that we haven't talked about really. It's personal income. Okay, uh, yeah, that's up one percent. That is a massive figure. Okay, it's if it's up 05 percent, it's massive. Mm -hmm. It's up one percent. Okay, why is it up one percent? Compensation for like workers is actually only up zero point four percent. The bulk of it is from government programs. They call it transfer uh, payments. OK, this is really due to like Social Security payments and other contracts that they have that the government's paying out. That's ultimately leading to higher services inflation, ultimately giving people more money to spend, ultimately contributing to this inflation problem. You know what else contributes to this inflation problem? What? Is when your president of the United States says, you know what? I'm going to forgive student debt. Oh, now he's spending government dollars on student debt. OK, problem number one. But it gets worse. People don't go down this rabbit hole. I love rabbit holes. I'm sticking everything in. Rabbit you know, holes. I love all the rabbit holes. I love getting in a room. can't fit. But if he could, he'd love rabbit holes, too. He loves the bunny holes. He love the bunny holes. So I went down the bunny hole. I'm like, OK, well, if what? Guess what, Saeed? What? You had student loans. I did. Yeah. Poof, gone. Oh my I God. spent government money to get rid of it. Oh, so how much more money do I have to spend every month? That's right. Consumer discretionary spending spikes up during the recession. Because people aren't looking to save them money now. Oh, no, now I got to spend it. I have to. Said, I saw his viral TikTok. Now I got to invest the money in some shit. I got to get the latest gear from H&M. You know, I had a thought. I went down the rabbit This is not in the show notes again. God damn it, I'm departing the night, but fuck it. I, I, was, I was sitting here thinking to myself, like, we spend, how much money we spend on aid in foreign countries and their wars? Oh, my God. Billions, right? Don't get me started. Okay, a lot. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, like, why we we put out that the your viral TikTok. Fuck, I can say we, it's yours on my account. And we put out your viral TikTok. Right. So if you put hundred and sixty some dollars into an account per month. Per month. Right. Every year, blah, blah, blah. Basically two thousand dollars a year. Because of the compound interest power. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. For eight years from nineteen to twenty seven. And you don't invest anything again after that average rate of return, 10%, you'll make a million dollars. So I did the rough ballpark math on this. Do you realize if we just put for every newborn kid that's a citizen in this country, like seven or eight thousand dollars into an account the day they're born? Oh no. They're they're born. Right. And you just let that money compound over time in something like an S and P fund. Yeah. The overwhelming probability is is every single person in this country will have a million dollar retirement by the time they're sixty five. Yeah. You know, so. you know, how, if you took the birth rates in the United States, right, and you multiplied it by, let's just say, seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars, on any given it? year, it's about twenty billion dollars. Very feasible. That's fucking nothing in the grand scheme. No. Of our spending every single year, right, as a country, right. That's a valuable use of tax. To Why aren't we literally investing for the kids born in this country so every single one of us, instead of getting fucking bullshit Social Security of $1,700 a month, why don't we save that money right. and make everybody have a million dollars? And don't give me the bullshit that, oh, my God, inflation, that a million dollars would be only worth 200000 by the time they're 65. Nobody fucking cares, bro. And you got and you have to oh, – this, this would be amazing. And you have to take a uh, get a certified license from some some university, some maybe um, uh, college, you know, your local city college, 
that says you passed a personal finance course so that you could then go take that money out. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. I'm just saying. Like, there, there's, a, there's so many better vehicles to do this, but nobody does it. Why? Mm. Why I got to be the asshole who says this stuff? Mm. You and invariably, it. somebody's going to be like, look, man, you don't understand the plight of the generation. No, I understand the plight of the generation. Okay, I understand that a million dollars 40 years from now ain't a lot of money if you account for inflation. But it's better than nothing. It's a lot better than Well, look, by 40 years from now, there, there won't be Social Security. Yep. So what about that? Facts. Yeah. No cap. Bars. All the bars. Arun, how do you feel about said topic? <laughs> Please agree. chime in. I agree. I found out this weekend that <clears throat> the U.S. sends over $3 billion to Afghanistan. I'm Afghan. I don't think the country deserves it. Like, why? Why are we sending money over there? Mm. Look, you already found $3 billion. Yeah. You got to find 17 more. <laughs> and every kid born this year, good. Oh, they, they, they got to keep their allies happy, man. They got to control those pipelines. <sighs> Arun, I know you don't listen to the show, but if you go down to the Kobisi letter, the next article there, I'd like to talk about that for a brief minute. Mm -hmm. This from the Kobisi letter, core services, less shelter inflation is a key metric that the Fed follows, also known as super core inflation. Yeah. Right. So j let's just break this down for everybody. You got inflation, right? And then when the Fed wants to remove the volatile topics, which is food and energy, mm -hmm. it becomes core inflation. When they remove the shelter component, because we all know that shit is out of whack and it's crazy and there are lag effects that take a long time for it to prove right, they got to remove that as well to then look at super core inflation. This, this shit is, so is This up. shit sounds so lame, bro. You know, you know what it's lame? Is like, look, ooh, inflation is going the right direction. What about core inflation? Oh, it's going the right direction too. What about super core inflation? Ah, oh, fuck. You, I, <laughs> you can't just say, what about when you take out shelter? Why you got to call it super core inflation? I know, right? But, he, but here's the problem, okay? And here's the real problem. You can always manipulate data to justify what you want. Mm -hmm. You just got to know what your conclusion is. You see this problem all the time in science? Hey, guys, I'm from Pepsi-Cola, okay? I need a study that says sugar is not going to kill people. Right. Then the researchers go out and find a study that says it's not going to kill people. Can I ask you a question? Who's paying those researchers? Me. Pepsi-Cola. Yeah. Mm. So I know you want to do your other science stuffs yeah so i just need you to say this and then you can go do your other science stuffs with my monies right exactly yeah that's how that's that's basically how the nutritional system works yeah <laughs> it is in january this metric super core inflation jumped by 0 0.7 percent month over month the biggest jump since september of 2022 this comes after multiple monthly increases since 2023's low while headline numbers are falling, many key categories are back on the rise, all while real wage growth is turning negative again. So if real wage growth is turning negative and we still have inflation, that means the money that you are making is less, but the things you are buying cost more. Right. That means the fight against inflation is far from over. Right. And actually, um, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bosta came out and said, look, I know you guys are all happy with this 2% uh, handle on this inflation figure you guys are talking about. I know you guys are happy because we have said we are aiming for that 2%, but I want you to know in order for us to get to that end result, it's going to get real bumpy real soon. And this is probably what he's talking about. You know, I didn't tell you this, but I was on the phone with somebody from D.C. last night, politician, uh, and <laughs> we were talking, and he's like, God damn it, fucking Neil Kashgar just made a comment. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, Chris, don't do it. Don't, was don't. he was he baiting you? Yeah, I, I don't think so. Come on. I think he just felt that way. And I'm like, hey, man, uh, just out of morbid curiosity, do you think Bostick fills out his dot plot with crayons? <laughs> <laughs> like, is he at a children's table? <laughs> and Bostick he, or Kashkari? No, no, Bostick. And he's like, he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, because I know Kashkari is at that table. Oh, yeah. I just want to know if Bostick's there, too. Yeah, did they have a second chair for him? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and then anyway, uh, he didn't find it fun. It took me five minutes to explain it to him. He's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. And I'm like, because he's, you know what? Never mind. You know, thank <laughs> yeah. you for telling me you don't listen to the show. Yeah. And then I'm like, the one joke that got him, though, I'm, I was like, you think Neil's got alopecia? And he's like, <laughs> I'm like, that's the joke you laugh at? That's what you like. Will Smith would be very offended by that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You guys can't be friends. <laughs> All right. So moving on, inflation came in hotter than expected in January. And it may take a few months to know. If Arun's paying attention to the show as I'm reading. All right, Arun, I'm going to need you to chip. What are you doing back there? <laughs> Dude, what did I do? You are clearly not paying attention tonight. This is the third article in a row. We've been ahead of you. I moved it over here. It's right here. No, mm. we're on the This is not no, the, this, the, the, the new, next new one. one. 
you know, he, I think I think he's googling stuff. He's trying he's trying to help out with the show, but you don't you're not asking me any questions. Uh, are you is that what you do back there? No way. I'm very confused no, on what I do wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I told you a bone, dog. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> what are you doing back there? Seriously, what are you doing back there? No, I scrolled down to this. Are, video. I, you did that I was literally reading it while you were scrolling it. Yeah, I know. I scrolled it up for you. You want to read it like this? Yeah, yeah. He, was oh. trying, he was trying to hook you up. I literally he scrolled thought, it up He, he thought here. you could read it while it's moving. You, you don't uh, got that in your arsenal, huh? I scrolled it up pretty damn slow, I can't too. read as it is. Come on, man. You, you I know. can barely read when he's telepromptering me. The news Jesus, station. I thought I fucked up. I By the way, I've got a whole new respect for fucking news like anchors. News anchors? Oh, these teleprompters? What If they if they move too fast, then you got a boom goes the dynamite situation? I've never felt like somebody reading off a teleprompter was reading. Like, I feel mean? I feel like they like they, they they come off like they're like literally just like this is hey I'm just fucking talking. I, I'm pretty sure it's a script that they're they're going over and they are kind they kind of know. Like if you read it over once, not during like live events and shit. Oh, live events, yeah. And they always do it in like and you got to be ready for full like newscaster voice. News, what's newscaster voice? Inflation came in hotter than expected today. No, they're they, not they, doing they, that. They, they do it all the whole time. <laughs> yeah, they don't actually talk like that. Come on. No, come, anyway. Inflation came in hotter than expected in January, and it may take a few months to know if it was a fluke or if price increases are getting stickier. But one key part of the inflation picture may already look far worse than things really are. Now, I quoted a lot from this article from the Washington Post titled, Rent is Driving Inflation, But There's Something Off in the Data. Mm -hmm. Said and I, if you listen to the show, have really lamented how fucked up the job numbers are. Well, jobs report coming out this Friday. Employment, unemployment. Guarantee you that the result's going to be fucked up. Yeah, it's not going to be very yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little spoiler alert. That's going to be our response whenever we hear the numbers. Yeah. All right. But that being said, this is another massive problem. And for those of you who have been longtime listeners of the show, we have often commented about how shelter, about how rent costs, rent equivalent costs, which yeah. are a huge component of getting inflation to the number where we know that the Fed wants it to be is a huge problem to get there because you're just not seeing the data move fast enough. And this article breaks down why the collection of the data is number one, off, and number two, what you experience, what I experience, what the whole world experiences is not what is actually being represented in the data. Perfect. Let's so see. can I go off on the diatribe now? Yeah, please do. All right. Rent costs have been driving inflation for months or at least in the way the data shows up on official reports. So if you remember correctly, at the top of the show, how we talked about there are certain components of your credit score that make up 35%. Well, for the inflation figure, the this uh, shelter component actually for CPI makes up 34%. So it's yeah. a big deal. Big deal. Yeah. The Federal Reserve has pushed its baseline interest rate to the highest level in decades. And prices in most other areas are moderating. So it's been a bit of a mystery to economists why rent hasn't followed suit. That's especially because almost every data source except the Consumer Price Index kept by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, anecdotally some place the jobs numbers come from, shows that those costs actually are cooling significantly or even falling since its growth peaked in early of last year. Right. So there's a common problem here. It's the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Statistics? Statistics? Yeah. I can't fucking say that word the ever. BLS? Yes, the BLS. It's full of BS. Yeah, exactly. But that shift isn't showing up much, if at all, in official inflation numbers, okay? So you got a problem. So we're going to go into that problem and talk about where the fresh data is coming from. And we're going to talk about kind of really what we're feeling. But I want everybody to keep a context here. Unfortunately, whether you like this or not, this is probably true, but it's not going to change. And if it's not going to change, there's only one of two outcomes that are possible. Either we're going to hit the inflation number because this data is going to show up eventually, probably late to the party, mm -hmm. and the Fed's going to have to make a decision, or the Fed's going to have to cut rates ahead of hitting the target number. Mm. Those are the only two outcomes here. And we did say, I, I mean, I did say that that was going to happen. You did. You did. But technically, this is why you get a laureate. But technically speaking, if it has a two-handle, I mean, I can't really claim that victory. If PCE has a two-handle, I mean, come on. What am I celebrating here? I feel like you're celebrating life. You're celebrating gratitude. I'm celebrating 1.3 million on TikTok. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh data from apartment list shows that rents fell for six consecutive months before ticking up 
slightly in February. Costs on leases are down 1% compared with a year ago nationwide, with more than half of the nation's largest cities seeing drops. In Austin, costs fell 6.7%. In Atlanta, 5.3%. And in Nashville, 5.1%. These are big declines. Right. But that shift is not showing up in the data, okay? It's just not, if at all, in official inflation reports. In January, a key measure of housing costs ticked up over the previous month. The CPI, well, also shows shelter costs up 6% compared to the over one year ago, down from a peak of 8.1%, but still leaps above normal. Right. So, and in the month before that, it was 6.2%. So, this routine, this has been going down at a cadence of somewhere around 0.2%. To 0.3 percent every single month, and which is why we ultimately said early on a year ago that this inflation problem will not be going away anytime soon as long as this figure is still high, because it's going to take a long time for this to come down. Oh, yeah. I mean, because of the way it's being reported. Everyone, if you can pull that paragraph up a little higher so I can read it a little clearly, because otherwise I sound like an idiot. Well, I know I'm an idiot, but a little higher, a little higher, top of the top of the page there. There you go. Come on, there you go. There. Go, 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 go. Economist, there right, yeah. stop there. I'm telling you, he's watching a game or some shit back there. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think he's forgetting which which paragraph you're reading. I just read it. <laughs> you, were, you were co-signing hard. I'm throwing him the bone, bro. He can't, he's not on the mic defending himself. Arun, please. <laughs> not watching a game. Yeah. Mm. That did not come off genuine. All right. Economists are quick to say that a pivot is coming and that January data is often riddled with seasonal glitches that push inflation up. They also argue that real-time metrics just take time to break through the wonky math behind the BLS's BS calculations. Mm. That's partly because an individual unit is only captured in the surveys every six months, which is weird, even if the leases cost changed in the interim. Plus, the BLS tracks rents for all tenants, not just those starting new leases. People staying put in place for a year or more might not see their costs change as rapidly. Okay, so there's a lot to break down here. You've actually covered this on a previous show. We have, yeah. yeah. So, rem so remember, what's being tracked here are executed leases. So if uh, an apartment unit or a house goes on the market that's up for rent and it's being marketed for said dollar amount, that isn't what's being recorded. It's actual leases that get executed and signed. OK, and you got to remember when it does get signed, that doesn't mean that they're reporting it right away. The BLS, the BS comes in and asks region by region by region, which is why sometimes it might take six months. It might take nine months for you to go back and you report your updated, you know, rent uh, prices. So if the FOMC were truly to wait until the inflation got to the number where they want it to get to. Right. Because higher for longer, and to get to these numbers, we're rather overcorrect and undercorrect. And you know, based on this, that there is clearly a six-month lag in the data aggregation for what is a 34% component to the bottom line number. Wow. You have got a serious fucking problem on your hands. I mean, dude, is it not 2024? We can't get this data like updated more frequently? This is crazy, man. It is crazy. I mean, for the same reason why everyone can't have high-speed internet at their house? Or at their studio? I got that Google Fiber, bro. But what about here, the studio? I got a fucking glorified hotspot. <laughs> I know, That's right? What it is. I, how, why is that still a problem? I, first of all, look. You can see what I'm doing from outer space, but you can't give me better Wi-Fi? I'm just saying. Come on, man. dog. You know there's technology that the government has that can literally use the Wi-Fi in your home to map out a 3D, 3D image of what's going on in your home at all times? So do you actually know how this actually works? Can you break this down? The science behind it? Yeah. Absolutely fucking not. No, not the science. So Wi-Fi signal, what are they picking up? So like my cell phone? They can use the radio waves in your home, which come from your Wi-Fi router, which is arguably the most strong one and the most common one in most people's homes, mm -hmm. to map out what a 3D image inside your home looks like using effectively an equivalent of sonar. Basically, did you watch the movie Batman? Yeah. It's exactly what he had. Um, uh, he's finding the Joker. Yeah, not Ooh. Samuel L. Jackson, not Lawrence Fishburne, but... Come on. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. God damn it, Yeah, yeah man. I watched all the Batmans. What do you mean? Come on. I watched all the Batmans? I watched all of them. All the... <laughs> my favorite ones with Morgan My favorite Freeman. one's the one with the bat on his chest. Yeah, yeah. My favorite one's the one with Morgan Freeman. That's the best one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I need you to read the name so I can continue the next paragraph. Go ahead. 
<laughs> I saw this. Orf. One. Orf Divungai. Orfi Divungai. Orfi Divungai. Okay. You can't make this shit up. If your name's Orfi Divungai, okay. Yeah, you better hope this shit doesn't come up on the podcast. You come up with a fucking nickname, bro. Yeah. OD. Oh, that's a great nickname. I just, I'm OD. You can call me Orfi. Orfi? That's kind of, I mean, that's a little weak. Orfi? That's got to be, Orfi's got to be short for something, right? Orfi Takamos. <laughs> Divungai. <laughs> I don't even know what country that's from. Uh, don't pull it up, bro. Oh, he's a senior economist. And he's a top voice. 10,000 followers on LinkedIn. Damn. Uh, yeah, but but uh, where's he, where does he work at? Ooh, Zillow. Yeah, sorry. Minus one. Yeah. Mm. So sorry. Sorry, Orphy. Yeah. Go back on timeout. We're going to have to say, even though you're a top voice on LinkedIn, you're not in the higher standard. Nope. Okay? Yeah. Nope. Not yet. He's a senior economist, Zillow. He posed a hypothetical scenario in which market rent growth stops completely. This is actually really smart. Hypothetically. Why wow, are you giving Orphe some love? Okay. No, I, I put him in the article because he had some valid, you know. Okay. He's make not, he's making the case to you know no, what he's doing. Brilliant man. You know what he's doing? Uh, he, he he's trying to flex to get Redfin to send over some type of you know yeah. offer. Guys, look, I know you guys need real economists over there. I mean, y'all got data. I'm, I'm good with data. I'm only at Zillow because you haven't given me a number yet. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, so he poses hypothetical where effectively, okay, let's say market rent growth just stops completely. It's dead even. Zeros. Right? Okay. Even then, it would take another two years of flat readings, no growth, two more years to drag down the entire shelter index to a normal 2%. Yeah. That's why... That's why Raphael Bostic said it's going to be a bumpy road because that's not going to happen. Not going to happen. So, bottom line, okay, mm -hmm. without question, you can infer something from this about what the Fed is going to do. But I want to finish this one paragraph first. Please do. That picture is all part of why economists remain optimistic that the lags will be overcome eventually. Jay Libick. National Director of Multifamily Analytics at CoStar, who I actually met, said it typically takes market rent about three quarters of the year to filter into government statistics. That timeline may be getting stretched out given how bizarrely the economy has been performing and how off models have been as a result. But hopes that we haven't been dashed yet. I don't like that they could just say, oh, you know, our, our models were off. That way, CPI looks at housing in general, Libick says, just doesn't seem to match reality. Right. So here is what you can infer unequivocally from what we just read to you, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a very clear, thoughtful, delineated, reasonable approach to why the BLS's data for this particular piece, mm -hmm. shelter, is off. Okay. Delayed right. by at least six months, or in this case, three quarters of a year before it's captured. Right, and six months is a long time, especially with the type of economy. That could be the difference of a quote-unquote soft landing mm -hmm. or a hard landing into a depression. Yeah. So, shelter component needs to drop down. It can't be flat, because if it's flat, it would take two years to hit to that Fed target number. Right. It needs to drop down considerably. You've already seen it drop down 5%. Yep. Not enough. Nope. To get the 2% target number. You can take this and say the Fed will never hit their 2% target before they need to cut rates. That is not going to be the impetus for them cutting rates. Right. And it shouldn't be. Because the fact of the matter is, it is a momentum game. It's as inflation cuts and continues to move down, that continued direction down, they cannot just pull the ripcord and stop it from moving down and say, okay, we're growing at a healthy 2-3% inflation. Everything's gravy. We're Gucci. Let's go. <laughs> It's going to have to be rate cut, see how much it slowed, rate cut, see how much it slowed, rate cut, see how much it slowed, and when it starts to balance out. It's going to be a prolonged period of figuring that out. Right. During that period of figuring it out after rate cuts have started, if they're lucky, they will hit this target number. Yeah. If they're not lucky, and I really mean lucky, you hit a recessionary economy. Big time, yeah. And I, I don't, We don't say that lightly. I say lightly as fuck, boy. Your boy Jamie Dimon back out here again saying, yo, I know Wall Street's out here pimping out soft landings. I'm telling you guys right now, it, better likelihood of it being the hard landing. You know how much like the rhetoric is spun back and forth? If you're if you're just like a casual economy like person, like you just read, you dip your toe in, you read a little bit, you dip your toe back out. Right. Go talk about archaeology for a while, come back. Yeah. You love that archaeology. I love boy. the archaeology, man. Every night. I'm starting, we, my wife and I just, uh-oh, I'm outing myself right now. <laughs> 
You we have started watching Loki. We haven't started watching Loki, but you're about to be happy. We're watching your boy Graham Hancock. Graham Hancock, so good. Yeah. The the series. Yeah, the series. It's a great series. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic series. And Joe Rogan does a guest appearance in that one. Oh, he does. Yeah, the one he goes to, I think, is Peru. Oh, okay. Yeah, Joe Rogan pops up. He's like there in person, on site. I going. ain't gonna lie, it's so cool, man. Yeah, it's, it's so it's, cool. it's, it's it, I mean, I it's, told you to watch that series, didn't I? I think you did. Yeah. Um, and coincidentally, whether the algorithm picked it up or my phone was listening to me and it started really advertising it to me, so I I just decided to check it out. Guaranteed lock that these civilizations before us, they were there and they got wiped out. Well, since that show to now, they use that lidar tech lidar technology to find an even larger, like ten thousand year older mm-hmm. big civilization in the Amazon, far surpassing anything that we've ever knew existed there, including streets, sewers, entire city infrastructures, roads. Right. I mean, they they have found so much since that time. Plus, and how is this not hitting national news, man? Because Graham Hancock is 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 very much pushed up against against the establishment. Traditional archaeologists really try to push him out. Mm-hmm. They try to label him like a crazy person. But what what has he gotten wrong? So I mean, he had to he's had to have gotten something wrong. Well, the problem is is you wind up having a lot of people in the archaeology world. It, it's decision by consensus, and whenever you're making decision by groupthink. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to move the needle unless you get enough people to swing to your side. Yeah, because you're rewriting all the history books. And you're basically saying these people that you trusted for a long period of time to tell you how things happened did not, in fact, know how things happened. Yeah. And there, therein lies and, but what's the But what's, what's so wrong with, with, with saying, like, yeah, I didn't, we don't know how it happened, but look, there's evidence is clear. Look, well, there's there's been botanists that have come out and said that it would only take a thousand years for agriculture to take over and make it look like we've never been here. Yeah. Only a thousand years. That's yeah. not a long time, dude. And some of these civilizations were tens of thousands of years old. Right. And, I mean, you've got another Stonehenge under Lake Michigan with carvings of mastodons in it. You've got a new uh, monolith structure that was just discovered off the coast. I want to say it was Germany, where it was, it's massive. And it basically was used for a hunting tunnel. Mm-hmm. They believe Stonehenge may have been used for that purpose too, right? Where you drive animals into it because there's a long road up to it. Right. So many of the things that we think we knew about civilizations, they, they believe they found what is tantamount to the lost city of Atlantis off the coast of Australia. Right. But it's so far out in, in the middle of nowhere, but it once was a landmass that likely sunk, hence leaving the highest part there, Australia. There, there's so many things that are happening at such a frequent cadence, but it's not sensational. And people generally don't care. So you just... Unless it's in your news feed and it's in your algorithm, you're not going to hear about it, dude. But so, given where we're where we're going now and everything that we're talking about with AI and the digital world that we're living in now, doesn't it freak you out a little bit? Like, man, if that got wiped out, like, there's no record of anything. Well, I mean, I think about it in the context of like, look, look at the. I used to be really into the solar system and planets and everything else, and then as that started to evolve so fast. Mm. I almost lost interest because it became so difficult to comprehend the mass of it all. Yeah. When I grew up, there were nine planets. Right. Pluto's not even a planet anymore. Right. But they've found hundreds of planets since that time. Oh, yeah. And the solar system is expanding in such a way that it's insane. But we're not close enough to have this tactile nature. And at some point, the light bulb went on for me. I'm so fascinated with like outer space and aliens and all this other stuff. But there's entire parts of this world here mm. that we fully do not still understand yeah it's true i mean i took an actually i took an astronomy course in college that i'll never forget this one example that the professor gave it was in one of those big like auditorium uh classes mm-hmm. and what he did is he showed a, a picture of you know the earth from outer space and then he zoomed out to like a bigger planet and then to the sun ultimately and then yeah. the next biggest star and it kept zooming out zooming out zooming out so far out that you could no longer even see the earth and he went to the screen and he took like a pen and he's like, if I were to op- open this pen and I just made a dot on the screen right now, Earth would be smaller than that. Yeah. And I remember thinking, holy cow, man. There's a, there's a great computer generated imagery on how far it takes and how long it takes to get to planets and how far distant galaxies are and things that we've been able to see. Uh, it, it's 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 incredible. Space is such a vast thing that it's 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 difficult as a human to comprehend Mm -hmm. you know and then you start thinking about the context of time when you're young in your 20s you feel like you never think about mortality right 
when you're in your 30s, you start to think about it in the context of people around you. You know some people that have passed away. Hopefully, that's all, that's all it is. Mm-hmm. In your 40s, you go, fuck, I might be at the halfway point. If I'm lucky. Yeah, if you're lucky, right? Average lifespan is like 77? 79, 80, I think. Yeah, anyway, whatever. And then you can start thinking about, okay, wait a minute. Then your parents get older, and you start seeing them have health issues, and dementia in some cases is becoming very prevalent now, and all these things that are out there. Yeah, man. And you start to think about how small our life is in the scope of what took millions of years. Dinosaurs and cultures and things that were here before us. Look around. You don't see evidence of fucking dinosaurs anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Look around. You don't see any. I mean, we were, were. this was Indian tribe territory. Right. You don't see any, any evidence of Indian tribes here. Exactly. That's how quickly you could fucking vanish off the face of this earth. Yeah. Not just you, me. Humanity. Yeah. And I mean, it's, I know it's morbid, but that's still going to happen much faster than inflation falling, unfortunately. <laughs> way to bring it, way to bring it back, dude. Yeah. <laughs> the next and, article is. And meanwhile, meanwhile, we're over here talking about inflation in the Colbisi <laughs> letter. Yeah, the next article uh, I, I think is um, is a, is a really powerful one. Uh, pending home sales are officially back below 2008 levels, according to the Colbisi letter. What does that mean? Pending home sales are, are officially back low. Okay, well, to put it colloquially, it means that there's either such low confidence or low inventory or such high rates and an affordability issue. Whatever the Molotov cocktail of messed up shit is that you believe in is happening. Is so bad that leading up to 2007 is when the Great Recession really kicked off. And then it was really hard to get a mortgage. The, more, the whole market was kind of crashing down. There's lots of foreclosures. You're seeing less activity now than the second largest recessionary event in modern human history. Yeah. And we're not in a recession, according to the markets. Let that sink in. Let that, let that marinate. January p- pending home sales fell 6.9% year over year and stand right above a record low. And the chart shows it. This helps explain why mortgage demand has been down for five straight weeks to its lowest level since 1995. Interestingly, pending home sales fell the most in the South and in the Midwest by 7.3 and 7.6% respectively. However, they did climb uh, 0.8% in the Northeast and 0.5% in the West. Unaffordability is clearly a thing here. And for context, I want people to understand that when you look at charts like the one that Arun just brought up, all right, y'all. Uh, you wind up seeing a lot of volatility. And one of the things I can absolutely full heartedly admit to is over the course of history, so far, home values over time have always risen over the broad strokes of history. Now, there's been some ups and downs and periods in between, mm-hmm. and not all recessions are housing recessions. And in most times, you're, if you take out the span of history over the human lifetime, let's say 100 years, mm-hmm. generally speaking, Home values always increase. If you were to go down to a period of seven or five years, that isn't always the case. And there is a lot more volatility in that narrow period of time. I am worried that what we're seeing right now is indicative of something more, but I have no data to really support that. It's hard for me to believe that anything that's happened in the past is likely to happen again with home prices because I don't think we've been in a scenario like this where it's been so unaffordable. And people are sitting on such low mortgage rates. Well, Arun, if you do me the favor of going to the next article, there's a $34 trillion debt problem. And I think mortgage rates dovetail nicely into this because of the title. This according to Fortune, hotshot Wharton professor sees a $34 trillion debt triggering 2025 possible meltdown as mortgage rates spike above 7%, to Saeed's point. It could derail the next administration, certainly from a political standpoint. But I have to give credit where it's due here. Saeed, you've called this debt problem since the first fucking time it was brought up on the show. And you've Mm -hmm. been pretty consistent on it. And with an opportunity to make fun of Brian Moynihan interwoven into this, I thought we should quote some context here. Let's do it. Gomez predicts America's $34 trillion debt burden may upset the world's financial markets as early as next year should a president-elect announce a raft of expensive policies. Of course, if a president gets in the office, they're going to want to execute their policies. Things like student debt forgiveness, where you're just spending our money. Man, you think you think you really wanted to do that? I, I feel like it's, I feel it was all a gimmick. 
I think he wanted to get votes. Just to get votes, yeah. Yeah. The warning isn't chi- uh, chiming all alone. Uh, isn't ch- chiming alone? Is that what it is? Mm-hmm. Warning isn't chiming alone? That's mm-hmm. interesting. Since the beginning of the year, an increasing cacophony. Is this guy trying to fuck with me? Come on, oh, Forge. <laughs> the interesting this? cacophony of alarm bells Who has this? been ringing out. Pringle. Yeah. Oh, good for him. Eleanor Pringle. Oh, her. Yeah, I know her. All right, so J.P. Morgan uh, Chase CEO Jamie Dimon says there will be a market, quote, rebellion, end quote, over the issue, while Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan says it's time to stop, quote, admiring, end quote, the problem, and instead do something about it. Dude, this guy, man. Brian Moynihan. What are you doing, man? I don't know, man. Literally, I want to say two months ago, you were like, consumer's in great shape. Yeah. Yep. I, we, we see their savings accounts. They still got all their pandemic savings. Yeah. And now look at them. Now now we're admiring the problem? What is, Brian what is Moynihan's that dad who walks in and says, I didn't say that shit. <laughs> yeah. Get does. your room clean. But, but, Dad, but Dad, didn't you tell me to empty the dishwasher? No, I said get your room clean. Oh, shit. And why isn't the dishwasher done yet? <laughs> what the fuck's wrong with you? Yeah. I'm Brian Moynihan, God damn it. I'm at $30 million. No, uh, 29. 29. Right. 29.7. <laughs> <laughs> This fear is echoing outside of Wall Street, too. The Black Swan author, Nassim Taleb, says that the economy is in a death spiral. That doesn't sound grim at all. While Fed Chairman Jerome Powell says it's past time to have an adult conversation about fiscal responsibility. Can you imagine if you're in the White House hearing that shit? Bro. This motherfucker right here raising our rates, costing us more money, and you want to have an adult conversation? It's past time to have an adult conversation about fiscal responsibility? Come on, dog. Do you, Jerome Powell? You understand this is your fault, right? You get like you we're in this position because of you. Let me tell you, if I was the president of the United States, I would literally unannounced walk my ass into the House committee tomorrow where he's testifying and be like, Hey Jerome, I want to have an adult conversation about fiscal responsibility. Some WWE shit. Yeah. Like you just open the door. Vince McMahon walks in. Yeah. But hey man. Yeah. Let's talk about fiscal responsibility. Let's do it. How responsible fiscally do you feel right about now? Yeah, remember when you called this shit transitory? Yeah. Remember well, when you said that? I'm feeling like it's pretty fucking permanent at the moment. Hmm. Remember when you, with this all started out, you said there would only be seven rate hikes, and then you ended up doing 11? Transitory. It comes and goes, right? Yeah. It's been a couple of years now, Dro. What happened? What happened, Jerome? Yeah, your name's Joe, right? Yeah. Kevin, Jeff, Johnson, whatever, whatever the fuck your name is, go fix the problem. That's what we pay you to do, right? Right. Mr. Powell. Yeah. Pow wow, trying to have a pow wow. That's what he's trying to do. Yeah. Fucking guy. Somebody give me some baby powder while I slept this bitch. Yeah. All right. But despite the presidential candidates likely won't be getting on stage with promises of how they'll wrestle down the debt to GDP ratio to a more palpable, palpable figure. Palatable figure. Fuck, I can't read it. It should be palpable. Well, figure. I can't read it because technically there's a camera in the way because Aruna's listening to the show anymore. Exports are cur- experts are currently predicting it will reach 190%. By 2050. Okay, so to put things into perspective, I'm telling you, he's watching something back there. To dude. put things into perspective, it it's never crossed over 100 up until recently. If or we're we're, we're teetering that line, it's gonna double. It's gonna not all. It's gonna double. Like this is like Japan's figures, right? And what ha- well, what ha- what's been going on with Japan recently? Uh, well, actually, they had a re- they had a rebound. It's pretty good. They had a rebound. that's really good, but yeah. then they drop from one of the. Top three best economies to now the fourth or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they, dro- like, they look, dropped. They, they had a recession. Yeah. Yeah. So look, and why this is such a big problem when interest when the Fed raises their interest rates and we owe thirty four trillion dollars, just like your credit card bill when that when that balance continues to grow and and the interest rate on your credit card continues to go up, your payment your minimum payment goes up. You want some context, kids? How many trillion? Thirty-four trillion. It's gonna be thirty-five okay. real soon. Yeah, <laughs> thirty-five trillion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for twenty billion dollars. Okay. Right. You could literally make every child born this year a millionaire by the time they're sixty-five, guaranteed. Right. Guaranteed. I love that idea. I know, right? I should I call the Rock? But look, I need a running mate. You seem like a guy who's got a little bit, you know, like influence, I guess. <laughs> what do you think? You got some pull? I think I think you're better off calling uh, Logan Paul. That's more your style. You guys going full rogue. Full rogue? Yeah. I don't feel like Logan Paul would be a good running mate. Come on, man. You're like hip to the social media trends. You'll do all that shit with him. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, I have a pretty I, good I, feeling. He's I, I want you to know that you're the mate in that relationship. <laughs> he's not going to be your running mate. <laughs> well, I'm not Kamala Harris. Don't do that to me. 
Dog, dog. Don't, don't do that. I want I want you to fully understand. With Logan Paul, you're the running mate. That's not true. That's what you are. You're, you true. are his Kamala. No, hell no. That's what you are. No. Let's get into this. You be beautiful... his dick. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah, dick Cheney. Yeah. Yeah. You be his dick. Cheney. Yeah. Right. You're the dick in the relationship. Cheney. Right. <laughs> Let's get into this review. You got this, or you've been doing enough reading tonight? No, I've had enough dick. Go ahead. <clears throat> there. I saved it to the end. Can I get a little bit of love? Through cough? Yeah. I was uh, actually going to give you kudos after the show. Really? But then yeah. I just broke it? Yeah, you broke it. You okay. Broke, broke the seal. So this from, who is it? Patel. What is this? What's the Meet name? Meet Patel. Meet Patel. Meet Patel. Yeah. All right. So uh, five-star review. Here we go. I was referred to this podcast by a friend in the gym a few weeks ago. Shout out to Kieran. I was instantly hooked and listened to all the latest episodes and started to listen to past episodes. Why, thank you. I don't, I don't get that enough. You know, I, I appreciate the people that actually go back. Because you know, usually with these you know, uh, current events type of podcasts, people are saying, no, I want to stay up to date with the current stuff. I'm not going to go back and listen to old stuff. Are you shit talking our own podcast? No, I'm I'm glad that he did it because I, I yeah, think it's just shit talking our own podcast. No, I'm saying I think it's worth your while to go back. He doesn't even listen to the show and hear you shit talking the podcast. <laughs> that's, not, that's not me shit. I'm saying that's what people do. God damn it. Like you gotta really learn how to self-promote better. I'm saying I'm saying you should go back and do it. This review is a test for the team to determine whether I, a human, wrote it, or perhaps I am pretending quite well to be a human. Yeah, I gotta tell you, when I read this joke, I thought it was terrible the first time around. It's yeah. equally bad the second time around. But we lo- look, I love you, brother. Like we had a good conversation, but you know, yeah, AI not your thing. Leave the AI jokes to professionals, okay? <laughs> Starting with the team, Chris, I don't know who this next person is, and Orun have a great bond which permeates through the show quite well. It does permeate. You think he's fucking with me? That's what he's doing. What? Everyone always misspells Orun's name, but he sees my name is I'm gonna fuck with Saeed. I'm gonna misspell his name. That's what he did. Oh, I didn't realize, Patel, I, didn't... I respect it. I respect it, Patel. Uh, their humor, as others have mentioned, makes the show digestible. However, we crave to know more about your personal life, Saeed. It's true. Same we all way do. as Chris. Okay. Yeah, see? I mean, look, obviously, we are kindred spirits. Patel I told Chris, ask me anything. I'll, I'll answer the questions. Since I love the show, I reached out to Chris and was pleasantly surprised to see his interest in me. Wow. He, you know what he thought? He's like, there's no way this dick would answer me. That's, that's the type of vibe you put out. People are like, no, nah, this guy's such an asshole. He was pleasantly surprised that you responded to him and you were willing to engage with him. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I get that. I mean, I am I am kind of notable these days, except to TikTok. <laughs> yeah, what's going <laughs> yeah. on? Yeah, TikTok, what happened? I got to submit an ID with your face on it. <laughs> so they tell people about that. That's actually, I think that's actually worth like mentioning. What? That like you actually gave them notable sources that actually reported on you, and that wasn't good enough. Oh, I didn't follow up on this. So... I, I literally said, because they wanted three sources from reputable, so I think I gave them like the today.com, I gave them uh, Architectural Digest, and I gave them Los Angeles Times. And then they This wanted, is all to get verified on TikTok. Yeah, they wanted a link to like the, the page, right? And I don't have a lot of followers, but that's their notability standard, whatever, you know? So they responded back saying the links don't meet the, the I guess, journalistic standards, or whatever. So I literally sent them an email, because I knew I had an email from like people in the industry, I sent him an email with literally 37 like sources in the last like 45 days. I said, here's the last 37 like media mentions I've had. Tons of credible chores. You pick your source that's credible for the four or whatever you need. Nice. They responded back today saying, yeah, you don't meet the criteria. And unfortunately, we can't tell you why. We can't tell you why. Yeah, we don't disclose publicly why. And I was like, all right, cool, thanks. I'll just go fuck myself in the corner over here. Nah, and then I just deleted my TikTok account. <laughs> I did not delete it. No, you didn't. I should delete it because I removed your 1.4 million follower. Like, Don't do reviews. that. Don't yeah, do that. We need that. that. Yeah. Uh, let's it see. It never happened. My thought, let's I'm see. I'm Thanos. <laughs> Gone. My thoughts on the show and even <laughs> asked me to suggest any additional topics to cover. Goes to show he is truly passionate about the show and the listening community and hence can never be the villain of the show. It's true. It's facts. Oh, that's where you're dead wrong. Nope, the content wrong. covered in this show is well-focused and is a good blend of current affairs and conceptual nuances of the world of business, economics, and finance. While there are numerous inside jokes, only extensive listeners will be able to distill to their full potential. The show does not have a walled garden preventing newcomers to dabble. Unlike Apple, I'm an Android and PC user who cannot leave this review on Apple because maybe Tim Apple was bullied in school and now he hates everyone who doesn't use his products. 
I'm going to go ahead and say this is a real person because I don't think AI would leave a run-on sentence like that. That was a really long sentence. Look, AI, AI. You know what? I feel like you're insulting Patel here. Like, I, like, hey, I mean, look, he, Patel took a shot across the bow, bro. He, he, my name is in the show, man. It's you know oh, how to spell my name. It the second time. Oh, that that's how you know he was fucking with me. Like his name's Me Patel, bro. Oh, what you mean? He, he's he's just trying. Well, if he's a true listener of the show, he'll appreciate that I'm ragging on him a little bit. You're not ragging on him. You're being racist, bro. Racist. You asked me if you owned a hotel before the show started. Chris, that's messed that's, up. That's messed up. That, hey, Charlie Munger Charlie. did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and if you haven't seen that clip, do yourself a favor. Look, yeah. look it up on YouTube. Charlie Munger was a racist. <laughs> the only constructive improvement I can make is to toe the political line from time to time and discuss more complex topics to both bring to light issues no one else will discuss and encourage the listening community to critically think and research more into these complex areas. Keep up the great work, team. On a final note, riddle me this. Am I a human? Who wrote this or not? He's human. He's human. I mean, yeah, yeah it's mm. written from a Motel Six. That's that's. Wow. Yeah. It, it's love. Uh, I'm no, Asian. No, no, you're, I'm Asian. It's love. Yeah, but he's Southeast Asian. You're, what does that mean? You're like not. Nah. I'm Southwest Asian. Bro, you circle white. You're you're. Uh, that's no, not true. You do circle white, don't you? What? You circle. Look at him. Look at him. I do. <laughs> you do, huh? I do. Oh, that's not on. true though. You're Wait. Asian, bro. What do you circle? I am white. Okay. Odin, what do you circle? I'm just white. <laughs> white. Wait. <laughs> Bro, you guys are both Asian. What are you doing? No, we're not. Why are you disrespecting the culture? Wait, what makes you... What? what ma I was born here. Afghanistan is Asia. I'm Caucasian, bro. I was born here? I was born right here, It doesn't make you less your ethnicity. That's just where you were born. Wait, what do you mean? So, I, I, the, look at my skin tone. It's it's real pale. Okay. Are we going to get into this woke culture where you identify as white now? Is that what that, it is? That's what it is. God damn it, Saeed. What are you going to say? Are you going to tell me, tell me on the show that I'm not white? You were not white. <laughs> you were not. That's white. so racist of you, bro. That's not racist. Uh, I'm like disgusted by you. Afghanistan right is. Okay, please Google up, Google or search whatever you want to do back there while you're not watching the game. You know, I'm not. I'm not even this. I'm not doing this. No. No, we're not. I'm not doing it. I'm not no. doing it. End the show. No, fuck <laughs> this. I'm not. This is, this is the trap. I'm not falling for the trap. Go ahead. Make sure you hit that like button. Leave us a review. Odun, you got anything? Nope. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. That was a very powerful bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>